All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Marketing 360. Um, really hope you all had a good spring break. And again, apologies for forgetting that that existed and having to kind of readjust the schedule. Um, hopefully it's all squared away now. So yeah, let's get into lecture four. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a hefty one, so bear with me. Just as a quick reminder, I've kind of deleted all the stuff I've already done. I'm just wanting to illustrate what needs to be done moving forward, what's left in the course. So exam two has been posted since before spring break and it should be open until March 22nd. Um, that should give you a full week to take the exam. So please do so. Um, again, it's mandatory. So now uh, in section four, we're gonna cover lecture four and five. But for now, we're just going to do lecture four, which is basically two PowerPoints, but I'm going to do them both in one um, lesson, one, sorry, recording, sampling and measurement. So that's going to be open from March 18th to 29th. And the first week of April, lecture five will open up on questionnaire design, which is still in section four. Um, but I'm going to give this lecture a little bit more time to soak in before we go into questionnaire design. So um, by April 1st, I need you to you know watch this lecture, read chapter eight through 10. Important to read this one. I think there's a lot of content that's helpful in there. Um, you should follow along with this PowerPoint and you should really make sure exam two is complete. So that's those are the most important things to do by April 1st. Um, we'll have an exam the second week of April and then we'll, we'll tackle the last two sections um, pushing us into the final. So getting there. Appreciate everyone's hard work and attention. So let's get right into um, this section. So up until now, like, you know, we kind of talked a lot about theory and kind of like planning and designing the research plan and the research strategy and understanding the concepts. Um, but from here on out, it's going to get a little bit more executional and like, okay, we've picked everything out. We've designed everything. We've kind of planned a lot of stuff it's time to actually start talking about, you know, specifics and getting detailed and getting uh, more executional in nature. So um, this section is going to discuss sampling procedures. Um, what are the different ways we can sample, how to determine who we want to survey and how many should we survey? Very important questions. Um, this is a head scratcher for a lot of people. And I would say this section really is one that people kind of like glaze over um, and a lot of researchers I know don't think very critically about sampling. Um, it can really put you behind if you don't know these theories and how to kind of like go about executing a uh, valid sample plan. In this section, I'm gonna do a lot of real world examples just to like contextualize everything for you. All right, so sampling plan, you know, and data collection kind of similar um, steps in the process here, but you know, we're, we're about halfway through the entire research process plan. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of these definitions in our more theoretical sections, but I want to refresh them for you and remind you that these are all gonna be on the test probably, or, or to some degree they will be on the test. So population, you know, um, I'm sure everyone knows that word, but just remember it's the entirety of, of, of a group of people from which a sample is drawn and which is the target of the research study. So, you know, if we use our soup metaphor, the population is the entire bowl of soup in which we want to take a, a spoonful sample from to see how the whole soup tastes. The census is the survey of the entire population. So this would be like drinking the whole bowl of soup to decide how, how it tastes or the, the whole pot of soup. Um, you know, the U.S. Census is aimed to survey the entire population or as many people as they possibly can to get accurate representation. Or there is what we call a sample, you know, a small part or quantity intended to show what the whole is like. Um, so, you know, that's more what we're going to be doing in survey research and market research is just sampling. Sample representation is making sure that that sample you take is truly reflecting the target population and the whole population. Um, we talked about this in the last section, but we're going to talk about it a lot more now is building the sample frame. So the fits, the sample frame is literally the listing of like, like writing it down, um, you know, codifying the like list of people or objects from which you're going to try to draw the sample from. And then finally, the plan is, you know, again, just building all this 
putting it into a document, outlining it, you know, um, and actually like executing off of the plan. Um, on the right there, I feel like there's a good little image of like a population versus the sample. You don't have to take to survey every single one of those people. You can survey a few of them and, and based on their similar characteristics and, you know, learn a lot about that population. Um, I just mentioned a lot of it, but just a reminder of the soup metaphor, uh, you know, you don't need to, to drink the whole pot to know what it tastes like. You can take a sample as long as it includes the accurate mix of ingredients um, and so on and so forth to make sure that it's true representation of what the soup tastes like. So remember that, that's important. Okay, so that's kind of the quick refresher. Let's talk about some new concepts now. So there's basically four or five big steps in building the sample strategy and executing a sample. So the first is to define the population. Second, to identify the sample frame. Third, choose a sampling procedure. Four, decide on the sample size. And five, select the sample, which is basically doing it. So we won't cover that too much. It's basically like execution. Um, so we're gonna follow these four steps, four or five steps and, and outline each step. Okay, so step one, defining your population. This one is like relatively easy in practice, right? Basically like when you're talking to your stakeholders, you're building your research plan, you're creating an RFP, you know, you're, you're um, just kind of like developing the whole strategy behind your research. That's where you're gonna start to already get specific about what population you're talking about, right? But I think what's important to know is like, it's really, it's really crucial to write down what who the population is to make sure that everyone's on the same page, right? Um, example one, right? That could be like all Meta customers. We want to talk to Meta customers, right? That's very, very, very broad, and is going to take a lot of, um, you know, implementation to make sure you sample a representative group of Meta customers, right? Because that's such a big audience. Um, for example, two, right? Like all Spotify premium subscribers, still really big, but in a way it's a little bit more refined, right? The population is premium subscribers. So that's like the kind of key attribute of interest, um, that makes it a little bit more palatable, right? Either way, the point is, is that who are you really trying to represent in your survey? And that's what you need to find out right now, right? Are you testing the bowl of soup? Or are you testing everything on that's on the, the dinner menu, the bread, the meats, the soup, the you know sides, figuring out exactly what and what you're trying to um, research is what's important. Okay, so building the sample frame, right? So again, this is basically like the frame is the like word they use. You can kind of think of it like, you know, you are trying to paint a picture of something and you want to have the right paint to paint, the, you know, to the right paint colors to paint this picture with, right? You're trying to figure out what is it that basically comprises the picture that you're trying to, you know, create, right? So that you can actually, you know, tell the right story, make the right picture. So um, a sample frame is like, you know, um, the, but I think it's kind of best illustrated from an example, right? So let's just say we go with the Spotify premium subscriber sample frame. All this data is completely fake, by the way. Let's just say Spotify was only in, you know, four markets, US, UK, Germany, Brazil. Okay. That's, we are in so many markets. That's, you know, that's barely a sliver of our markets, but let's just say that was true. And of our entire Spotify premium subscriber base, 35% are in the US, 28% in the UK, 22 in Germany and 15 in Brazil, right? 100%. So our whole entirety of sample is broken out that way. We also know, have other few variables that we care about, right? Usership, like weekly users, monthly users, less than monthly users, right? Those are all important to make sure we talk to, right? Um, we also know that there's 65% um, male and 45% female, right? Actually, I fix that. Yeah, here we go. Um, which again, all this number is fake. These numbers are fake. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and age and content, all these other variables that we know make up 
our Spotify premium subscriber base, right? So we want to make sure that when we collect sample from these people, that we're not getting all females, right? We're not getting all 55 plus. We're not only getting music listeners because we know that it's not reflective of the entire population of Spotify premium subscribers. So to be able to know that, we have to actually have to build out this frame, right? And there's some moments where you don't have to do all of these, right? Maybe maybe we don't care about um, you know age in this frame, right? Maybe it's okay to not have to look into age and make sure that age is represented. It probably is, right? But there's a world where there's a trade-off that has to be made between like, okay, we can't sam we can't survey people forever trying to fill these specific little things. And you know, it's gonna, it's it's just there's reasons to not budget, timing, difficulty. Um, but most of the time when you build a frame like this, it is important to see everything, think about everything so that you can make a good choice in terms of the procedure you choose. So that's kind of like building the frame. It's basically like establishing what that picture should look like. Okay, so again, this is gonna get kind of interesting. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to say, okay, we've got our population, we've got what our population is comprised of based on the sample frame. And we now want to figure out how we're actually going to go about sampling from them, AKA how are we going to actually taste the soup, right? Are we going to dip our spoon in once and try it? Are we going to, you know, carefully go throughout and pick out every single item of chicken and the carrots and the soup? Are we going to go in and try to get that? Are we just going to randomly do it? Are we going to systematize it in some way? These are all kind of like things that we're thinking about in terms of like this metaphor, taking it as far as we possibly can. Um, so there's basically two overarching procedures, right? There's probability samples and then there's non-probability samples. So let's kind of, I have the definitions here, but let's get into the nitty gritty so you can really understand what that means. So the probability sampling is that you basically are selecting at, at complete random. There's no influence by you as a research, or researcher in terms of how you're actually going about sampling from these people, aka getting survey responses from these people. Um, in the probability sample, everyone in the population has an equal chance of getting selected, right? Um, that's used when, when you're really worried about biasing the sample, right? Um, you don't want to say, oh, I want to force more weekly active users because I want our sample plan or our, sorry, our population to be rep more representative of active users, right? And maybe that's not true. Um, so you don't want to bias the sample in that way. It's really useful when you have a very diverse population and it's easy to get those responses. Um, it's the most accurate sampling method. Um, but there's some big trick tricks of this, right? Um, the tricks of this are that, let's say you survey people, right? And you're trying, let's just go back to our Spotify example here. We're trying to build this population based on this frame, right? And we do a simple random, we do a, sorry, a probability sample, which is like a simple random sample, where we just say, okay, here's our group. We know that this is what they look like, right? We know this is their makeup. We're going to send the survey out without any restrictions, without any, um, influence on how, how we're actually tasting the soup and see what happens. You should get your data back and be able to look at all these variables in your data. And it should look really close to this, right? Because of, that's how the reality of the population looks, but there's a lot of things that can influence that accuracy, right? Um, weekly active users on Spotify are more likely to take surveys. They're more likely to see the survey because they're using it more often, right? Um, they're more likely to fill out all the answers because they use the app more often. So they're more likely to, to have opinions and thoughts. Um, you know, in general, females answer surveys more than males. That's just a general survey rule of thumb. So you might get your sample back and say, oh, well, there should be 65% males, but there's actually only 40 and the rest are females. That's not right. Um, 
that's because of these things that are going on in the back end that are kind of impossible for a probability sample to account for. So that's kind of an issue with probability sampling. However, a key advantage to that is that when we do a probability sampling, we can actually compute things like sampling error, right? Um, we can do margin of error, we can do confidence intervals, we can do all that stuff to help us understand <clears throat> how accurate we think our results are and communicate that back to our stakeholders or our clients, right? So when we talk about probability sampling, it is more accurate as long as some of these things I just mentioned can be accounted for. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can account for that, but we'll talk about those in a minute. So non-probability sampling is different. It's a lot more um, heavy handed from the researcher's perspective, right? Um, the sample is selected based on what I think or what the researcher thinks, right? It's not just based due to chance. It's not rolling a die anymore. It's me getting more in, uh, involved. Um, and not everyone has an equal chance to participate. Um, you know, it, this says the sample does not accurately represent the population, right? That's, that's true, unless there are some things that you know for sure, we'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's also really helpful when finding respondents is easy because you have a, you have more um, ability to control what happens in the sample. So those are some of the big pros and cons. Again, there's kind of some caveats that we're going to talk about. And it depends on, you know, um, the project more or less. But let's 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 get let's get into the details of each. So I want to start us off with non-probability sampling, right? Um, to kind of give you an easy idea of like what probability sampling isn't, right? So the first type is called convenience sampling. So this is basically where people are asked, are chosen for a research study based on convenience alone, right? This is very problematic. So uh, one of the most typical research examples is someone at a mall who's standing in the mall waiting for people to come by and ask them questions, right? They're not choosing who they're asking based on any uh, requirement except for being at the mall at that given point in time and walking by them at that given point in time. You know what I mean? Um, so it's just convenient to ask, hey, would you be willing to fill out this survey? Um, there's nothing more than that, right, when it comes to a convenience sample. So it's basically just the researcher standing there deciding, yeah, you can get surveyed. Sure, why not? You're here. What about people who go at different times? What about people who walk by different stores, go in different entrances? Maybe they're only walking by that store because they're close to the bathroom or, you know, there's all of these different things that can come into play um, when it comes to a convenience sample. Um, purposive, and I've never heard it called that, and judgmental uh, sampling also, where basically researchers use our own judgment to select the sample. So let's say that we go to the mall and we think that nine out of every 10 female, uh, sorry, uh, mall visitors are male. Um, we assume that. And so we, we stand there and we wait to get nine males as every 10, you know, person, relatively speaking, walks by, they get nine males and one female and you ask them the sample. That's just based off of what you think. Maybe you've been watching in the mall as the day goes on and said, oh, I think it's about nine, nine to one, you know? Um, you don't know that for sure. You don't know that based on any reliability or statistical measurements. You're just guessing. You're making a judgment about the sample and you're collecting the sample in that way. I'm going to jump quota sampling, come back to that in just one second. Um, we lastly have what we call snowballing or networking sample. So this is like a method of selecting respondents to participate in a study and then asking them to give us names or people they know or send a survey for you, right? It's kind of like, um, hey, uh, you go to Reddit and you say, hey, well, you guys fill out my survey. And if you have someone who might, you know, uh, be interested, will you share the link with them, right? Or in a more realistic use case where this could be used or is used when um, audiences are extremely hard to find, like doctors or like, um, you know, NBA players or NFL players or something that's a very small group of people who are hard to reach. You know, you could say, hey, uh, doctor, will you take the survey for me? And if you do, will you send it to one of your, your doctor friends, right? And kind of like, and then tell them to keep snowballing to get your responses. Um, the three that I just mentioned are 
not super common, you know, um, I would say snowballing is a little more common when you get into really nuanced industries. For example, I had to use snowballing at Goldman Sachs when we were talking to really rich people, <laughs> frankly, and could not figure out how to connect with other people in that way. So we had to kind of like get this network built up of people who are willing to, um, you know, share our research. Convenience and, and judgmental are, you know, um, not super common, especially like in modern day where there's so much knowledge and information on sampling. What is, and in my opinion, the most common form of sampling, even over probability sampling in our field is quota sampling. So this is a, a method of selecting a sample based on the target's population characteristics or criteria specified by the research or that definition is fine, but what I think it's missing is that specified by the researcher with info information, right? With accurate information. Um, so basically this is where like, you know, you know the population of the US, you know how many males and females you are, you know how many uh, ages groups there are, you know how many, um, you know, the different race distribution is, you know, the different income distribution, you know, all these demographic variables about people and based on the census, right? Not based on my judgment based on other stats. And so I try to build my sample frame and sample according to what I already know to be true. That's what quote, and then only selecting people in that way. So we'll talk about this more in a second, but just know that's the basics of quota sampling. It's very similar to probability sampling, right? Um, but it's it's technically non-probability. So let's let's look at probability sampling now. So the most common um, form of probability sampling, and honestly, you're hardly ever going to hear the term probability sampling or non-probability sampling. You're going to hear the specific technique um, mentioned, and you'll kind of have to know what that means. So you'll off, often hear about simple random uh, sample, simple SRS, what they call it for short. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this is basically where there's no no involvement by you at all. You just randomly pick people from a group of, of population and serve them. You you have no um, influence on it at all. You just kind of let what happens happens. You roll the dice, if you will. So like an example of that would be like, let's say you have 10,000 customers. Um, you randomly assign each one of them a number and then you pick 500 out of a hat and you say, okay, here's the 500 that I'm going to survey. Um, that's how you survey them, right? It, each customer has an equal chance of being surveyed, right? It's not like, oh, there's 65% males, so we need to pick out 65% of the people to survey as males, you know? There's no, uh, you know, influence by us. Um, systematic sampling, right? This is kind of uh, one that, again, I don't think it's used very often, but it's basically where you decide like a number, like every 10th uh, person or every 12th person and you survey them that way. And as that cycles through, it should ultimately be random and, and be probability based um, without any influence from us. The only thing you decide is what the N number is. Usually it's like the 10th or the 12th or something like that. Um, so let's say that you're, you're, uh, you, know, you have an online website and you want to survey people who come to your website as opposed to serving you know, 500 people as they come to the website, you kind of say, all right, every 10th person that comes to the website, we're going to survey them. There's some issues with that, but it's ultimately unbiased. And, um, you know, it does allow for you to kind of like do that over time, which is nice. It's not all the first 500 that get there. There's a little bit more of a, um, you know, kind of like systematic way of doing so. Okay. Stratified sampling. You, you do see this one a lot. Um, and it's a little hard to understand, to be honest with you, stratified and clustering are, but I'm gonna do my best. So stratified sampling is a method that divides the population into mutually exclusive and categorically exhaustive groups related to similar behaviors or variables, and then randomly selecting elements independently from within each group. So let's say you have 10,000 customers, 6,000 of them brought, bought product A and 4,000 but uh, product B. You split those into those two groups and then you just randomly choose from those groups, right? So you're kind of getting influenced a little bit in terms of, um, you know, choosing two different population groups, 
but they are different groups. And then you're just randomly sampling from, from them as opposed to the whole group randomly sampling from the whole um, pool of customers. Um, but you are using kind of that, uh, you know, judgment to say this is product A, this is product B, right? And they and they haven't purchased from one another because they're mutually exclusive. Okay, great. Um, the last is clustering. So this is a method that involves dividing the population in mutually exclusive category diagnostic groups or subsets, um, where each group or subset is assumed to be represented the population, uh, then randomly selecting from each uh, group or subset. So let's say you had, uh, I think your book uses kind of a good example of schools. And so you basically, instead of saying all the schools in Springfield, all the, high, the public schools in Springfield, that's your population, right? Um, you want to survey teachers from all schools in the, the school districts, as opposed to, there's not really like one thing you can use to, to group those kind of like product A and product B, right? All of those schools should reflect schools in Springfield, right? Uh, there may be some other variables. Sure, we could argue that all day. But um, instead of surveying all the high schools or all the, the schools in Springfield, they survey two of them or three of them randomly. They decide to just you know, select three of them. And your high school or school is should be representative of schools in Springfield, right? Because there's not really a differentiating factor um, in that. Of course, again, you could argue, oh, there's a different region, different students, different experiences. That's all fair. Um, but ultimately, that's how that works. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, I have an example here on the bottom that I think is helpful. So the brown dots in this chart are basically people who would have gotten selected to be surveyed, right? So um, Stratified takes all these little groups based on variables and chooses a few of them, right, to represent that group versus cluster sampling takes only two of them because all those things represent that group. Um, all right. That was a lot. Um, I wish that we were live so I could wait and have people ask questions, but that's probability and non-probability sampling methods. Um, I want really you to focus on quota sampling. I mean, the two most important ones that we just covered are simple random sampling and quota sampling. One's probability, one's non-probability. Um, but quota sampling is one of the most commonly met used methods in research. It's very simplified to stratified sampling as you just, we just talked about, right? It's kind of similar to this one on the bottom left where we're breaking groups up and then um, sampling from those groups, right? But there are a few key differences. So stratified sampling and quota sampling both involve dividing the groups. The main difference is that stratified sampling, you draw a random sample from each subgroup, right? In quota sampling, we're not doing anything random. We know exactly how many people we want out of each group. It's not random. We are basically predetermining what our sample is going to look like based on information that we have from somewhere else. So that's why it's not probability is because we're not really rolling the dice at all. We are predetermining everything. There's not any randomness involved, but it's based on um, you know information that we have, we're privy to as researchers. So this chart on the right is a perfect example from your textbook of um, quota sampling. So you have this is a quota sample based off of three variables: gender, age, position. I don't even know what that means, but sure, whatever position. Um, this could be gender, age, income, race, um, household income, or rest of that, whatever. There's a million different things this could be. Like it, uh, in the Spotify example, our quotas would be region, usership, gender, age, content, right? We know all these things based on our sample frame. And so instead of surveying people at random and hoping that it reflects this population, we can actually predetermine that and set it up accordingly. So in this example on the right, that number and percent column, that's the reality, right? 
the we know there's 4,332 patients that are female, and that reflects 57% of the population, right? So we know that to be true already. It's not me creating judgment or pre or you know um, assuming. That's just the reality of our customer base. Um, and then on the right is us saying, okay, well, to get 60% uh, females, right? Or sorry, 57% females, and we want 600 total sample, then we need to collect 342 female responses. That's what we need. Uh, and again, there's no, there's no, I'm not randomly choosing that number. It's based on the information, but I'm predetermining that if I want a total sample size of 342, well, 57% of that 600 should be females. Um, and, you know, 9% of that should be ages 18 to 24, because that's what our customers look like. So that's quota sampling, really important. Um, in a survey, if you've ever taken one, and let's say you 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 answer the first couple of demographic questions and you don't qualify for the study, or or they say, oh, you know, we're we're unable to like finish the survey this time. It's probably because that you aren't in the quota group they need, right? Maybe they've already got enough Chandlers, they got enough, you know males from Missouri who are, you know, have brown hair. They've got enough people of, in that group. Now they need to move on to get females in Missouri who have brown hair, right? Um, so they will, before you can even take the thing, they will decide if you are predetermined, chose, you know, or, or are able to fit in this group or not. Okay, so those are sample methods. Um, again, I would say nine times out of 10 in a survey, in market research, in 2024, you are going to do a quota sample. That's just almost always the case. There are circumstances where you, you know, like at Spotify, we have so many users, right? Um, there, there are enough users and enough um, chances for us to survey them that I can, I can do a random sample if I want. But oftentimes, for reasons that are out of my control, um, you know, it doesn't look like it should, and I have to do waiting, or I have to go redo it. Uh, we'll talk about some of that later. But anyways, quota sampling, one of the most important elements. And actually, I didn't write this on here. I will tell you some downfall of quota sampling, though. Right? Um, quota sampling can get you in trouble when you get really specific. So let's say. Everything you're seeing here in this table is at a very bird's eye view, okay? But what about if you look at, okay, well, how many males are age 18 to 24, right? And how many males age 18 to 24 are, you know, Dempster physicians or whatever this is? There's this kind of like permutations or what we call nested elements of quotas that are tricky because I don't want all my male responses to come in at 18 to 24. That would close out 18 to 24 group, but those are all males. So those don't, those two don't quite, you know, add up to be the same equation. So you have to build out essentially like nested sample plans. And if you don't, things can get weird. And there's definitely some issues with the quota sampling as well. So just keep that in mind, but on the whole, it's the most common method. All right, sample size. Oh yeah, yoy. All right. So I need everyone to put on their statistics 101 caps for a minute. You all should have taken that class. I think it's a prereq. Um, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna hit that that point home here. So on your right, you're gonna see the uh the all glorious um bell curve for a couple of examples of the bell curve. So what is sample size and why does it matter? Okay, so sample size is the number of usable responses needed by the client or stakeholder in a survey, right? So basically how many respondents, responses, excuse me, are you going to get to your survey? It's a very important issue because your clients and your stakeholders want to make sure that what you're telling them is accurate. The numbers that you're showing them are truly reflective of a population. Um, and as I said earlier, what we wanna really be able to do is to 
use those uh, you know measures of validity and statistical validity to prove what you're saying is true and that they should listen to you, <laughs> right? Um, so obviously it's a kind of a simple rule of thumb. Well, yeah, let's just get as many samples as we need, right? Let's just get as you know sample size as much as we possibly can. But obviously that increases cost, that increases increases time, that increases that decreases the ability to continually discuss, talk to your customers because you don't want to reach out to your customers a million times, you know, a month. Um, so there's kind of this, you know, balancing act between how many responses should we get and, you know, what kind of accuracy can we afford? The rule of thumb is, you know, if you're looking at a bird's eye view, you should get somewhere in between a thousand to 2000 responses to your surveys. That should be sufficient to um, cover all your bases. Now, larger samples may be needed when you're doing really, really precise research, right? Um, or you're doing really long surveys, or you have advanced analysis that we'll talk about later. Or let's say you want to take every single data point and cut it by age and gender and income and disposition, all these different things. The smaller you cut those data points, um, you know, the harder they become to be valid or the more unlikely they are to be valid. So it just depends on your study, but the rule of thumb is somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 is really um, helpful. Now, an illustration of that, if you look on the right, so this is your bell curve, and as sample increases, you can see how the margin of error starts to shrink. So as a reminder, margin of error tells you how accurate your um, you know, insight is plus or minus two, right? So if you have uh, insight that says, oh, 48% of people say this about your company, margin of error 2%, well, then it could be 44 or it could be 40. Did I say 42? It's 42%, it could be 44, it could be 40, yeah. Um, as you go from 96, which is this blue sample size, your margin of error is huge, right? You got a 10%, that could really change the outcome. So if you did the survey again, the chances of it being within 10% would be, you know, 95%, but, um, you know, really huge distribution there, really huge skewness. When you go to 380, you cut that in half, right? You get about 5%. All the way up to 2,400, you get 2% 2 margin of error, right? Which, you know, to be honest, going from 3% to 2%, not a huge cut. Is it worth paying for a thousand extra responses just to cut the margin of error by 1%? Maybe. Depends on, on your goal. So, you know, if you've ever seen, and this is all interesting stuff, and I highly recommend you commit these things to memory. Because it actually comes into play a lot in daily life when you're reading like medical studies, for example, right? If you see a medical study and they say, oh, you know, you should take this pill because it's going to grow your hair back or whatever. And you're like, okay, well, what's, how, what's the science behind that? And you go look at it and they, they surveyed 40 people and they, or they tested it against 40 people. And it'll probably say the margin of error down there. And it's like, okay, well, seven out of 10 people experience more hair growth, but that could have been four people or it could have been 10, right? Uh, there's really no accuracy to some of those studies if you really look at the data. Um, so it can kind of be a helpful day-to-day um, -day tip as you're moving through like, you know, adulthood and reading through all these different studies and stuff. Not to even mention political polling, which we won't even go there, but political polling has all these numbers, you know, impacted and influenced and can help you kind of like interpret these results. Um, so, you know, let's let's just go through a quick example again, right? So let's say that you you want to understand how many um, or what percent of U.S. consumers listen to a podcast relevant to Spotify. Your business needs to be very confident in this number, right? Maybe you're getting ready to make an investment decision, right? Or, you know, if you're in the medical field, you probably don't want a 4% margin of error because that can mean people's health or people's lives, right? So you need really tight, accurate results. Um, so you want to run a representative and balanced survey of U.S. consumers, and you find the number of people who say they listen to podcasts in the U.S. is 
you've done all your sampling procedures are correct, you've done your quota sampling, you've got your whole sample procured in the reflective way, and 40% say they listen to podcasts. Well, the U.S. population is about 332 million. Um, so if you look at the data at 40% and just say, hey, leadership, 40% um, of people say that you know, they listen to podcasts. A very likely response by your stakeholder will be like, okay, well, how confident are we on that 40%? You know, what's the margin of error? Is it, they'll, they'll probably say, is it significant? Which is kind of the wrong thing to say in this, in this scenario. But what they're really saying is, is it valid? Is it, can I rely on this? And as a good researcher, you could say, yeah, of course. Uh, great question. Well, our sample size was this much, and that resulted in this much margin of error. And we used the 95% confidence interval to calculate that margin of error number. So as you can see here, 40%. If, if your sample size to, to derive this 40% number was 200, well, you'd have a 7% margin of error. So if you did the survey 100 times, you could find responses landing. You could, you could probably, 95% probably, um, find responses that fall in between 33 and 47, right? So that's a huge, um, you know, skew or distribution there. So not great. Versus if you increase the sample size to 200, you're going to get a 2% margin of error, right? Which would mean that if you ran the survey a hundred times, you'll most likely find a, your, your, this, you know, data to fall in between 38 and 42%. So, Important to consider sample sizes, but you know, if um, this this forty percent number wasn't the base a big business decision off of it, maybe it was just a uh, to you know kind of like gate a pulse check or get a temperature check. Five hundred might be enough for you. You know, it really might. So, just really depends on on you know what you're trying to do. So, how do you determine your required sample size? Um, that's a great question. And there is a really big, complex, crazy formula that you can use. Um, however, you can also just freaking Google it. And that's what I do. Um, there's a million different Google um, options. You can just you know type in sample size calculator. What you will need to know, and either way, if you use this one or this one, you'll need to know what your desired level of statistical confidence is. Again, reminder from stats one, you, it'll be 95%, right? Unless you're in medical field or you're really um, trying to be you know, strict, it might be 99%. Or if you're a little bit more laissez-faire, you can be 90%, um, but usually 95%. You need to know what margin of error you want to produce. So like I said, it could be three, it could be five, it could be seven. And then you need to know how big your population size is. So this one I just uh, showed you, this example up here where we talk about um, U.S. consumers. So 330 million population size, you know, we want 95% confidence interval. We want to procure a sample that results in a 3% margin of error. Well, then we need to get like, you know, around 1,000 or 1067. So that will tell you exactly how many people you need to, to get. Oh, and here's a chart, rule of thumb table again. There's a million different ways you can kind of go about this, but I would recommend the sample size calculator to be as specific as possible. Um, cool. So one more thing really quick, which is that I wanted to just remind everyone about response rate, which we talked about in our last lecture. Um, response rate and sample size are correlated and are very different. Um, you know, Response rate, again, is the percentage of people who get your survey and actually respond to it and will take your survey and fill it out, right? We see that number anywhere between 6 to 10%, you know, 10% if your customers are super engaged and super loyal. Um, and so it's important to remember that when it comes to backing into your sample size. So let's say that you know you want 1,000 responses. Okay, great. But if you send a thousand email invites to your customers, you'll probably only get like 60 responses, right? Because not a th all thousand people are going to take the survey. So you have to figure out how to back into that number. 
right? So the easiest way to do that is take your um, desired sample size and divide it by your estimated or average response rate. So if you need a thousand responses, you have an average of 6% response rate, well then you're gonna need to send about 16,000 plus emails out or however you're gonna send it out. Um, you know, app notifications, website banners, whatever, to get a thousand responses. So remember that important and different. All right, cool. So we are going to now move to the next section, um, which is measurement. And I'm just going to keep the lecture rolling. Um, slideshow. Great. So we already talked about this. This is the second, the second kind of PowerPoint and lecture. Um, Okay, so now that you know how to like choose a sample and all the methods, um, we want to talk about um, the actual best way and different ways that you can measure things in a survey. This is not the where we're going to talk about the overall flow of a survey and how to like design a questionnaire that kind of is going to come next, but it's important to sample the right audience and ask them questions that are valid and produce accurate data. And this all is important in the setup of the questionnaire design. Um, cool, let's do it. So we're now kind of getting in the data collection phase a little bit where we're talking about how to collect data accurately. Um, so what is measurement? That seems kind of like a dumb question, but I actually think that the theory is really important to consider when, um, you know, we're, we're looking at these things, right? So it's like your textbook defines it as the process of assigning numbers or labels to phenomena or characteristics. So in simpler terms, you know, what we're trying to do is create a question, um, a variable or an observation that can be at the very least counted, right? Um, and if it can be accurately counted, it can open up this whole door and avenue to conduct advanced statistics or statistics at all, right? So it's not dissimilar from measuring a pencil, right? You're measuring the length of a pencil with a ruler or measuring your waist or measuring your height or measuring your um, weight. These are all measurements, right? Um, another good definition is the quantification. <clears throat> Remember, this is all quant research we're talking about now of attributes of an object or event which can be used to compare with other objects or events. In other words, measurement is a process of determining how large or small a quantity is as compared to a basic reference quantity of the same kind. That's a pretty good definition. So we as researchers, we measure stuff too, right? Um, but we're not measuring your height. We're not measuring how far you can throw a baseball or how fast you can throw a baseball. We're actually measuring more um, direct variables, right? We're doing what we call direct measurement, which we talked about many times, but another way that people talk about this often is self-reported data. So self-reported data is where we ask somebody something and they give their own subjective answer, right? Um, as opposed to like, you know, observing an objective truth, like this pencil is nine inches long, right? Um, it's more about this person feels this way and this person says this about themselves. Obviously, that can cause some issues, um, right? People uh, have bad memories and they have bad recall and they, they may have other influences and they maybe forget, maybe they don't know, maybe blah, blah, blah. There's a million different things that can, that can pose issues with self-reported data. So an example of this is on Spotify, we're often asking people, okay, well, how often are you listening to podcasts? You know, and then we'll say, okay, well, you know, if you're listening to podcasts this much, what services are you listening to it on? And they'll say Spotify, they'll say YouTube, they'll say Apple Podcasts. And then we say, okay, well, how much time are you spending watching, or sorry, listening to podcasts on each one of the services that you set? And they'll say, oh, you know, I'm listening to it one hour a day on Spotify. Then we can go and look at that person and say, no, they didn't. They listened to 10 minutes of Spotify podcasts. So there's a huge disconnect between that 10 minutes that they actually did and that hour that they said they did, they thought they did. Could be for a multitude of reasons, but that's an issue, right? Um, so we are measuring these things. They're all self-reported. They are all based on the respondents, you know, 
opinion or perception. However, we're still basically like the only people who can who can do that, you know, and we'll talk about that in a second. So um, instead of inches or other measurements, right, we're going to use scales and we're going to ask questions and provide measurement designations, otherwise known as recode values, to actually like quantify these things people are saying. Um, so survey softwares will automatically generate these things called recode values. But ultimately, it's where you're saying like, oh, the respondent said they're a male. Well, I can't, it's hard for me, you can do this, but it's hard for me to count the number of people who say male in a survey unless male is numerically counted, right? So all the males, that's recoded as um, two. Could be recoded as 77. Doesn't matter. There's no there's no meaning to the number. It's just to tell me that 77 means male, right? Um, so that's basically a recoded value. Um, sometimes you have to do it yourself, which is really annoying, but we'll get there. Um, so yeah, basically like, yeah, this is us measuring people, um, measuring people's opinions. And instead of using inches, we're gonna use scales. Um, all right. This is also extremely, extremely, extremely important. Um, there's a lot of things in this section that are important, but this is definitely one of the top ones. So there are kind of four theories. Um, we're kind of buckets of measurement scales, okay? Um, and knowing the differences of these can really help you understand what you can expect from the data, what you can do with the data, what you're able to um, analyze with the data. Um, what can also help you pick and choose what types of questions you're able to ask. So on the very bottom, we're going to start with what we call nominal data. So these are basically just categories, right? Male, female. Yes, no. Um, a select all that apply question is a bunch of little nominal questions, right? If you have a select all that apply question that says, which of the following things do you listen to? And it's like podcast, music. TV, radio, whatever. <clears throat> Each one of those options is a nominal selection. If you do select it, it's a it's a one. If you don't select it, it's a two. If you do select it, it's a one. If you don't select it, it's a 44. <laughs> the 44 doesn't matter. It's just to tell you that that means they didn't select it, right? That's not that's an indicator of a nominal data uh, question or skip. Um, ordinal data. These are ordered categories, right? There's a there is some sort of cognizant or reasoning behind the numbers, right? So let's say, you know, you say, okay, rank the top five movies you saw last year. The rank one does have a meaning, right? It probably means the best. The rank five does have a meaning. It probably means it's the worst, right? It's not totally arbitrary. Like putting 44 in there wouldn't work because there is some sort of meaning behind the number. Um, those two are a little more qualitative in nature. Um, you can still do things like what percentage of people are male, what percentage of people are, you know, uh, um, say this is their favorite movie. Um, but you're not going to be able to take it too much further than that, than just counting them, um, you know, looking at the percentages, etc. Then we have interval data. Now, this is interesting, and especially because interval and ordinal data get a little hazy. So interval data is when there are true differences between measurements, um, but there's not a real zero point. So let's say that like you're looking at a scale of zero to 10, and that is a true difference between zero and one. The difference between zero and one is one. The difference between one and two is one. The difference between two and three is one. And so there is a kind of a measurable distance between each one. The difference between zero and 10 is 11, right? There's zero, one, two, three, four, seven, and then 10, 11. Um, so that's kind of like how interval data works. We're going to look at some examples in a second. And then there's ratio data. Ratio data is really easily distinguishable because there's a true zero. So a true zero would be like your weight, right? You can't be negative weight. Um, or temperature, right? There's a true zero point. You can go negative in temperature, but there is a real meaningful zero point, right? Or age, you can't, you know, there's a real, you can be unborn, right? So there's this real obvious ratio element 
to data that helps you distinguish what's what. Oh, the last two are quantitative data. So you can do a lot with quantitative data. You can, can, you can, you can compute averages and means, and medians and modes, and you can do correlations and factoring, clustering and regression and, you know, uh, discriminant functions. And you can, you can start to really juice these types of data if you can um, produce scales that, that do so. So here's another just like quick chart, um, you know, nominal, A, B, male, female, et cetera. Ordinal, you know, um, how satisfied are you? You can't really, this is a good example actually because there's five scale points here on this ordinal scale, but they're all little happy faces, right? Or sad faces. Is there a clear like difference between each one? Like, can you actually compute the difference between the sad face and the neutral face? Not really, because it's not numeric. It's just kind of like, you know, it's just kind of in theory there. Um, interval scale, this is a good example where it says, you know, right from one to seven. And so, you know, one, and two, and there's other kind of more numeric and you can kind of compute the differences between those variables. Um, and then you have ratio, which is like how many hamburgers can you eat? There's a, a true zero point, you know, um, going from that's kind of a bad example. Honestly, a better example is, is like weight. Um, okay, going through each individual one, again, nominal scale, um, you know, divides a variable into two or more categories. Um, it's qualitative, they can only be counted. Um, you know, numbers don't define object-related characteristic. Each number is assigned to a random object. Like I said, it could be 44, could be 10, it just doesn't really, there's no meaning behind the numbers. Okay, ordinal scale. So, you know, again, this is where it gets a little tricky with interval. Um, Scale in which numbers are assigned for the purpose of identification, but also have the property of being arranged in some order or array, right? It can be named, grouped, also ranks. Okay, so the bottom one, we already talked about why we order no. There's not, you know, a true difference between the two. But the first one, we do have those numbers, right? Which can kind of start to get a little hazy. Um, but the reality is, is that you could totally turn this around, right? You could say five means sa uh, satisfied and one means dissatisfied. And the changing of those numeric values doesn't really matter. Um, so it's ordinal. But again, it can get tricky. So let's look at interval scales. So interval scales, um, you know, are, are the numbers do indicate specific order and then distance between the numbers are considered to be equal. So the, the rule of thumb, to be honest with you, between interval and ordinal is that are there numbers and is there enough numbers to really start to illustrate the equal equidistance between each point? Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. People will take ordinal scales all the time and conduct more advanced stats on them. They do, and even when they're kind of like inappropriately doing so. And it's gonna, it's gonna be fine probably a lot of the times. It might, it might be okay. It's close enough to being interval to where, you know giving an average or mean on it is fine. Um, but once you start to really get go down the rabbit hole of looking at advanced analytics behind these things, you're gonna start to realize, oh, I probably should have made an interval scale because it's looking a little, you know, a little hairy on the back end. So always important to kind of think about it that way. Um, ratio scales are, you know, which numbers are assigned for the purpose of identification. Um, the distances between the numbers are equal and the scale has an absolute zero. Um, as a good illustration here about how important that is. Um, so, you know, you can't weigh negative weights, um, you know, ratio scale units have several unique use properties. You can do conversions. These are basically, you know, your, your true measurements that you're going to see with a ruler or like, you know, a, 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 a scale. Um, so we don't often do questions like these in our research. We do sometimes we'll be like, hey, how old are you? And they just type it in, right? That's ratio scale. Um, but other than that, we don't do too much ratio scale um, questions. Um, I put in a few more examples just to remind yourself. So ratio data, you know, um, you can do all the type of analysis. Um, interval one to five scale, you can do some analysis. Ordinal scales, you can do some things, but it's a little bit less. Nominal and text, you can barely do anything on <laughs> analysis-wise.
examples of questions for each one. Um, okay. Uh, that's not supposed to be there right now. Um, moving on to research scales. So I have to play this video because it's perfect, perfectly made for someone like me in my in in a in a course. I thought very strongly agree sounded stronger than totally agree. So true, fellas. <laughs> um, so that's when we're actually talking about specific scales in research. So we talked all about the theories, right? I thought very strongly. And kind of like the overarching types of data they produce. But like now let's specifically look at examples of each one that we use within research, right? So specific question types that we're gonna use. Um, and I told you I was gonna talk about this earlier, but remember, one of the most interesting and unique, distinct and valuable parts of our jobs is that we can measure attitudes which is something that no one else can do. Data scientists can't do it. Data engineers can't do it. Social scrapers can't do it. Um, we are here to measure attitudes. And that's why scales are so important um, because attitudes have multiple dimensions. They're abstract. They're, you, know, you can't observe them. Um, it's in their mind, they have to bring it out. And we have to do a good job bringing it out and giving them options to truly help um, understand how they're feeling. So... Those question types that fall underneath the scales that we just discussed are really important. I'm going to share with you the most common ones, but there are a million different question types and kind of scales. Um, and your book goes into more, so please read your book. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the non-important ones. I'm going to completely spew some terms at you. They're all in your book, um, except for this third one, which is extremely important. I can't believe it's not in there. Um, so unidimensional versus multidimensional scales in research. Simple. Does it measure one or multiple attributes per concept? So if I say, how do you feel about anxiety? That's a one. How, and then there's one you can say, how do you feel about anxiety versus depression? And that's a, that's a multidimensional, um, scale point. Similarly, Comparative or non-comparative scale points can use the reference category or not. So, you know, compared to Wendy's, how would you rate McDonald's? That's a comparative scale. Or you could say, how would you rate McDonald's? That's a non-comparative scale. Pretty simple. Unipolar or bipolar, again, this is not in your textbook, which I think is stupid, but um, some scales will have opposites and anchored by a midpoint. Um, so that's really important. So you know, like that would be something like disagree, neutral, agree. So there's kind of those two polars. Excuse me, that's bipolar. This other one thing. Um, you get it. Unipolar is the opposite where there's not really a left point or a right point or a midpoint. It's just don't agree, agree, strongly agree, right? There's no like opposite end. It's just kind of like zero to whatever. Not negative one, negative two, zero, whatever. Um, and then balanced or unbalanced is if, if the scale has the same number of positive choices as negative or if it's skewed one way. So, you know, a unbalanced unipolar scale, that's common. Um, that's skewed towards agree, right? You could say don't agree, agree, strongly agree. Well, there's two agree points and one don't agree point. So it's an unbalanced scale. Um, okay. Okay. So rank order scales, not, uh, you know, very Eureka here. This is just where you ask someone to rank with the numbers, you know, and one being the best, seven being the least in this example. Um, really easy for a respondent to do this, relatively easy for us to respond, or sorry, to analyze it. Um, but there are some downsides, right? Like, you know, what if you haven't had all these restaurants before, right? Uh, it's difficult to say, oh, that's three, that's four. I don't know. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, it's just a little bit like kind of subjective and um, not super easy sometimes for people to, to respond to. Um, a couple of different ways you can kind of, you know, analyze rank order scales, right? You can, like this top chart over here is um, just of Olive Garden, what percentage of people ranked it first, second, third, fourth, and so on. So 25% of people said that Olive Garden 
was their second favorite. Or you can compare it to other ones, right? Like who what percentage of all people gave all of our the number one rating versus these other ones, right? So 22% of respondents said that Olive Garden was their favorite uh restaurant versus you know, six percent is Jade Garden. So that's rank order. Um very common. It's pretty nominal in nature, by the way. Um, this is about as far as we can take this, this data. Okay, graphical rating scales. So graphical rating scales are interesting because they can teeter on the uh, fence of providing interval or ordinal data. Um, some of the lines like this where people will literally take their mouse, click on it and, and drag it, <clears throat> right? Um, can kind of give you different options. So like this very bottom example down here um, actually shows like these numbers, like 70, 86, 96. That's helpful because that definitely makes it interval data, right? Uh, it really makes it easy for, for us to do advanced stats on it. And it gives the respondent the ability to understand kind of how they're selecting. The very top one, not so much, right? Like uh, as a respondent and as a, an analyst, I don't know what the difference between where they picked there is and where they picked over there. So that would be more ordinal in nature. So it kind of depends on how you're doing it. Um, I find these difficult for leadership and response to understand. Like, I don't know, what does the three mean on the scale? It's just kind of hard to determine. So I don't use these that often, but um, it is common. Itemized rating scale. Great. So with an itemized rating scale, you know, this is really common. Um, people will use smiley faces, stars, numbers. The way in which you go about doing this will depend on, again, interval or order data. So the top one, you can argue is interval because it has, you know, numbers, a zero point in the middle, a three or a neutral point. It's, you know, bipolar. Um, and that will produce interval-ish data, you know, arguably ordinal, but it could be interval as well. Um, versus the bottom are all very much so ordinal data. There's no way to tell the difference between those are. There's no numbers. It's kind of um, just a little more categorical. Really common. Um, you've probably seen these a million times. There is one itemized scale that's really important though, which is called net motor score. And this is like this, just like, way to be honest with y'all overhyped and over sold methodology where it basically says how likely is it that you would recommend blank to a colleague or a friend right and then it asks a interval-esque scale zero to ten um and you can rate you know ten being the best zero being the the, the least likely excuse me then what Net Promoter Score does is it groups all the zero to sixes together, the sevens and eights together, and the nines and tens together, and it makes those percentages, and it takes the percentage of promoters, subtracts the percentage of detractors to give this like one score or this one NPS score. So at its high level, the zero to 10 scale, not bad. You know, um, you can argue about the question, you can argue about how many scale points there are, whatever, but ultimately it's not a bad question and scale. Um, but a lot of these companies do this um, calculation, this net promoter score calculation to like, because they're beholden to this number, which causes so many issues in my opinion. And I, the book even talks about some of them and says, you know, so much data, richness of data is lost in this like simplification of the, you know, responses. Um, there's also something called the Anscombe's Trio in statistics, which basically says like, okay, let's say your company had a really bad score and they moved a ton of people from zero to two to four and five, like nearly doubling their ratings. The NPS score wouldn't even change because all those people are considered promoters, or sorry, detractors. Regardless of if they're all zero and ones and now are four and fives, they're all kind of the same. So pretty big issue with that. But, um, and oh, also once it turns the score from the scale into this calculation of percentages, you lose the ability for it to be interval data, right? It's now ordinal data um, at best, maybe even nominal if you really want to, you know, go there. 
Um, okay, last two scales that are really important. I love symmetric differential scales. Um, these are where there's basically two opposite attributes and they really, really, really need to be truly opposite, right? Like hate and love. Um, and it can really help you understand, you know, I'm neutral or, you know, I'm somewhere over here, or I'm somewhere over here. Um, what describes you best? You know, that's another way I like to use it. Like what describes you best, right? Um, are you a fighter or a lover, right? And it's kind of like an interesting way to, to look at this. Um, it's really, really interval data. Um, really helpful to have that kind of level of specificity with interval level data. Um, and yeah, it's just a really good way to, to kind of illustrate this to people and really easy for the respondent to understand, really easy for me to understand. It produced cool charts like this one, right? Where you can look at like both of the spectrums and see where what percentage of people are answering in which way. So that's really cool. Very interval type data. So that's semantic differential. Lastly, but not leastly, one of the most important popular scales in all of research and psychology is called a Likert scale. Um, ever since I started researching people, my professors and my um, higher ups would always say it's Likert, not Likert. People always say Likert, but it's Likert. Um, it's basically, you know, a series of statements about agreement. It can be other things, but usually it's agreement. Um, and it basically like avoids the difficulty of, you know, finding those right anchor words or phrases that are commonly encountered. Um, they're easy for me to understand, they're easy for you to understand, they're easy for everyone to understand. Um, they're easy to answer. It's just a very easy user-friendly interval level um, data point, right? Super helpful. Um, I use these all the time. You know, and intervals, or sorry, um, semantic differentials are nice too, right? But let's just say a way to take this and turn it into a Likert scale would be how much do you agree or disagree with the following about, you know, Home Depot experience? The staff was friendly, agree to disagree. The staff was helpful, agree to disagree. There was a poor selection, agree to disagree. You know, you can kind of just kind of um, reframe it in a more Likert scale way, and it becomes even easier for everyone to read and understand. It does lose a little bit of that um, subjectivity and kind of you bias a little bit by saying like, do I want it to say, you know, poor staff and have them agree to that or good staff and have them agree to that, right? It kind of has that bias that gets introduced, but ultimately it's just easier for everyone to understand this way. And um, I'm a big, a big proponent of liquor scales. You can do all sorts of cool, cool charts and analyses with these types of data, but here's one that I love that's like called diverging bar chart which literally uses space on the chart to show how close away it is to that uh, agreement or not. Um, so I love that. And I know this has been a long one, so I'm going to wrap it up here and say, thank you, watch the schedule. Um, I'll be emailing everyone annoyingly to remind you what to do. And up next, we're gonna cover questionnaire design and how we're gonna use all the scales and the sampling and everything we just learned to actually build out a survey. All right. Thank you, everyone.